Tool's fan base is one of the most extraordinary phenomenons in the history of rock and metal, and aside from the occasional holier-than-thou frat boy who just took his first acid trip, Tool's community is surprisingly positive. A lot of Tool fans tend to be introspective, empathetic, and intellectually curious. And it's no coincidence either, because Tool's music speaks profoundly to those sensibilities. And as open-minded and individualistic as Tool fans can be, the band and their supporters sometimes do give off a bit of a cultish vibe, right? After all, more than a few famous cults were based in sonic mantras, meditation, and psychedelics. But hey, so was Woodstock, and that was a good-ass time. The 60s Summer of Love version, not the 90s New Metal version. Plenty of artists have relentlessly dedicated fans, but you never really hear believers talk about how Justin Bieber's baby became the moral and spiritual compass of their life's path. There's just something different about Tool, and it's deeply rooted in spirituality. But Tool wasn't always a blatantly spiritual band. They fell into the genre of alternative metal with Opiate, and though the landmark EP was filled with their righteous anger Tool would later flesh out in Undertow, it wasn't until Anima that Tool really delved into that trippy, psychedelic realm. Before Anima, we were just following our gut. There was a lot of anger in the air, and we never tried to control that. But just as we mature as humans, with Anima, we tried to be fueled more by spiritual ideas, or more of a conscious mode of aiming things in the right place, or trying to take more responsibility for our art. Danny Carey. How did that all happen, though? Well, according to Ministries' Al Jorgensen, it was because of him. I'd put two drops of acid in my bottle of whiskey that I'd bring on stage. I'd drink about half the bottle during a show. So when we were on Lollapalooza in 92, I think it was San Francisco, and when we came off stage, there were these two guys who were like, great show, dude. So I gave them my bottle of Bushmills, but I forgot that I put LSD in it. So they drank it, and they were tripping balls for like two or three days. Al continues, they didn't know what was going on, and they were freaking out. They were ready to call suicidal hotlines. It turned out to be Paul and Maynard from Tool. But he actually thanked me for that moment because he said it really got Tool into being a psychedelic band. Pretty cosmic, right? Cool story, bro. But if you know anything about Uncle Al, it's that he often does spin tall tales. Also, both Al Jorgensen and Danny Carey remember Tool dosing Ministry with LSD, possibly in an act of retaliation. So LSD probably wasn't too foreign to the guys in Tool. Also, I can imagine this next guy explaining complex concepts behind his music, messing around with psychedelics in his youth. Roll it. Where did you get the name for your band, CAD? Uh, it's, it's not really a band name, it's more of a concept behind what we're all about. It stands for Children of the Anachronistic Dynasty, which is kind of like a bloodline of youth born out of sync with time, out of sync enough to where they sit back and observe rather than just take things for granted. So despite Uncle Al's claim of turning Tool into a psychedelic band, story doesn't really check out. So what really happened? Well, some Tool fans point to the influence of Bill Hicks, the legendary comedian who had famous bits about psychedelic drug use. Bill Hicks's bit about Los Angeles breaking off from California due to an earthquake and floating out into the ocean was a direct inspiration for Anima. But was it Hicks who turned Tool spiritual? According to Maynard, no. Did your spiritual leanings begin after your friend, comedian and philosopher Bill Hicks died? Maynard was asked by Yahoo. No. I think that was all prior to Bill. He just happened to enter my life around that same time. That's why he and I had lots of phone conversations about bigger picture things. So it seems like the pieces were already in place for Tool's psychedelic awakening, but what made them fit? According to Maynard, part of it was becoming a father. Another difference between Undertow and Anima is I had a son, Maynard explains. The catharsis I was looking for on the first couple of records came in the form of this child, which helped me direct all that struggle and the stress and that emotional turbulence that I was experiencing for so long and calm it down and give it more focus. One more dynamic, certainly, was the influence of bassist Justin Chancellor, 
who took over after Paul Damore left the band. Before Justin joined Tool, he was in a really cool progressive and psychedelic band called Peach. Rhythmically, Peach sounded a little like what Tool would become, mixed with 60s and 70s acid rock like The Beatles, King Crimson, Atomic Rooster, and Camel. And once Justin joined Tool, the band's rhythm section really began to morph from an aggressive, strummed, 90s alt-rock style into a smoother, more geometric and transcendental one. And though Damore did write some of the stuff on Anima, you can hear Chancellor take the lead during trippier tracks like 46 and 2 and Third Eye. Psychedelics are a good way of exploring the unknown, Chancellor told Terrorizer in 1997, because everyone is essentially confused about what we're doing here. And psychedelics and psychedelic art or music has always been free-flowing or stream of consciousness, and it's a good way of exploring the chaos aesthetically. The use of psychedelics in music was explored pretty much to its zenith in the 1960s, so it's not like Tool was a revolutionary band in that respect, but Tool did take an extremely inspirational role in writing about the spirituality of everyday life and the ability to discover deeply profound revelations without the use of drugs. Maynard was asked in an interview, is the use of drugs a way to enhance the third eye? Drugs definitely give you an alternate perspective. Your consciousness is like a radio frequency. If you turn the dial, all those radio stations are there simultaneously. You can dial in to hear what station you want to hear. Consciousness is the same way. Through meditation, you can alter that. You can come upon an alternate reality. Drugs is a shortcut to that. The trick is to really understand the medium you used to get there. So, psychedelics themselves may actually get a little too much credit for influencing Tool's music. Because the band's music isn't about peace and love, look at all the pretty colors, it's more about life's lessons one could learn from psychedelics or meditation, or therapy, or just picking up a book on natural science or philosophy. The point is, a lot of Tool's best ideas can be used in your everyday life, and not just when you're Rosetta Stoned. And that's why Tool almost became a religion for millions of fans. And those spiritual lessons acted as the driving force for Tool's monumental 2001 album, Lateralis. Songs like The Grudge explains the self-sabotaging pain of holding on to poisonous anger, along with the freedom that comes with letting go of your old baggage. Schism relays the importance of communicating with your loved ones and working together to solidify the foundation of a relationship, or otherwise be doomed to watch it crumble around you. Parable and Parabola explain the importance of not taking your life's most beautiful moments for granted. Also, Lateralis's tool of the Fibonacci sequence, a mathematical pattern found ubiquitously throughout nature, further cements the idea that every little thing, unimportant as it may seem, does have a deeper purpose. Listen to Tool album artist Alex Gray speak about his interpretation of the band's music during an interview with Metal Injection. I think with uh, Lateralis, I guess there was a, a sense that, you know, we're, we're really a package of miracles, you know. We're multi-dimensional, multi-layered manifestations of a, of a physical dimension of ourselves and the psychical dimension of ourselves is just a, a, a fascinating thing to contemplate. But it's a very physically oriented kind of uh, appearance. The next, you know, the, the 10,000 days then was this completely out of the body kind of thing and into like a spiritual world, you know, into like the, the heavens. And expanding on spirituality, Maynard expressed to Relics, All of my projects are about expressing a relationship, a place, a moment, an idea. Everything we create stems from one or more of these starting points. Just in general, spirituality is a great thing. You have to balance it with your feet on the ground. And that's why agricultural endeavors ground you. You plant this thing and it grows. You're witnessing magic. You have to get up in the morning and get rid of the weeds and make sure you're present and conscious with it. Along with the magic, there comes the response, and that's important. There's your balance. And the spiritual dynamics of Tool carried forth into their long-awaited 2019 album, Fear Inoculum. Hell, Numa literally means the vital spirit 
soul, or creative force of a person. And the song continues the out-of-body theme of 10,000 Days, encouraging listeners to transcend the perceived limitations of their physical and mental selves. Now look, I don't want to try to define Tool's music too exactly, and if you're familiar with the band, you know that they don't really want to define what it should mean for you either. And that's where the spiritual nature of Tool breaks from the conventions of your typical cult. You don't have to subscribe to any sort of doctrine to be a Tool fan. They don't want to manipulate you or control your mind or steal all your cash. You don't have to show up to their concerts every Sunday or confess your sins to Harry Mann back or wear a stupid hat. What you do have to do, however, is shut the fuck up while Maynard is singing. Can I get an amen?